Uh, is Baker Mayfield about to win a Super Bowl? Let's get into it. All pro Brandon Marshall here to talk Lamar. We'll talk the Cowboys that fourth quarter. My goodness. Jalen Ramsey uh, and DK Metcalf. That was fun. I have my popcorn out for that one. And I will figure out the playoff picture with the stupidest tie ever from the Commanders and the Giants. And I work the phrase Milwaukee Badgers into the show. <laughs> Is it even December if this doesn't happen? Here we go. The fines weren't enough to scare the cowboys from another dip inside the kettle. Uh, I would never be able to get out of that thing if I crawled in. Zeke and the boys ran away from the Colts in the fourth quarter uh, in historic fashion, 54 to 19. It was a blowout, but not really. If you didn't watch the game, you look at the final score and you're like, whoa, what happened here? But it doesn't come close to telling the story. This was a battle through three quarters. This was a 21 to 19 situation going into the fourth. And then Dallas somehow racks up 33 points in the final frame to completely put it away. And that is the most unanswered points a team has scored in the fourth quarter since the 1925, let's see it, the 1925 Milwaukee Badgers. Listen, Milwaukee Badgers are no joke. NFL team pre-merger, of course. Badgers, uh, they were around from 1922 to 1926. Asi Orwal was their big player. Listen, they had some epic battles and showdowns against their rival, the Pottsville Maroons, back in the day. What are we saying there? Did I get it wrong? Anyone? Oh, okay, he said nice. Nailed it, Pottsville Maroons, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna need that logo on a vintage t-shirt, but that's what we're talking about here, people. We haven't seen that happen since 1925, and it went from, oh no, they might lose to the Colts, to oh no, let the Colts at least get out of there with some dignity, a shred of it, will you? And it happened like that, beyond the offensive explosion. It was cool to see safety Malik Cooker have a nice moment against his team. We saw that all around the league yesterday, of course. Bobby Wagner, we'll get to that one. But uh, Malik Cooker's uh, a really strong player that has had to deal with a lot. And he's had injuries that he struggled with in his career. Now, if you look at the playoff picture as things shook out here post week 13, oh my gosh, the Cowboys, they're pretty much stuck in that five seed thanks to the Eagles, but they've continued to gain momentum with each passing week. And this team does feel a little different than past years. Am I right? Tweet me. Am I right? They're clicking. There's also something to be said about when it's happening, right? We're talking about week 14, momentum's building. You're seeing it uh, on the AFC side of things, I think with the Bengals a little bit. And then you have this other piece that might be somewhere named Odell Beckham Jr., a piece that was very relevant last year's Super Bowl run for those uh, Rams. Uh, and he is in the building, I believe, today. So even if the Eagles run away with the division, you still kind of can't sleep on Dallas this year, especially if they do bring Odell into the building and somehow don't let him out of the building without signing a contract to be a Dallas Cowboy. All right, now time, and please tweet me uh, at Up and Adam Show at Hey K Adams with our takeaways from week 13. That was a great battle right there, okay? And you guys went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, came out on top. It took everybody in this locker room. What do we say, Dolph? They got to play us! I'm happy with this. I'm happy with everything that's going on. The Bengals, uh, they come away with a dramatic, emphatic 27 to 24 win over the Chiefs. Again, three zip is hard to do. Three zip is hard to do here in that matchup going back to last year. Uh, this is a statement from this team that this was not a one year wonder or a fun Cinderella story. And I heard it all, all off season. It wasn't even on sports television. I was in Africa and I was hearing everybody saying, when you win, you win, you good, you win, 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 you Sorry, Kansas City, but Cincinnati is not going anywhere. Sorry, Ravens. And they're going to be a huge factor in the AFC once again where they should be. And what jumped out to me yesterday was the sheer confidence this team showed down the stretch. Even after, uh, okay, I'm just going to be dead, dead honest. I was, a, I was a little, I don't know if you saw my Twitter, you would have been like, are you even a Bengals fan? I was not super happy with some of the things I was saying because there were some costly mistakes that cost them some points. Like, Chase, love you. You're back. You're feeling it. The whole Reed thing happened. I knew there would be some riffraff out there. But the taunting penalty when you didn't even... <laughs> Chase, you didn't even score the touchdown. That was an interesting move. And you know, like, did you win the game in the second quarter? No. And then there was this weird thing at the end of the half that was infuriating where the Bengals, uh, just take the points. 
take the points, heard of it, it works. So there were some rough moments, but none of them shook the team. In the highest pressure situation, they they did their thing. They kept their foot on the gas, they made the right moves towards the end, and they stayed aggressive, and they, and this is what I tweeted, and I shouldn't have tweeted it because I'm a woman tweeting this to a bunch of men that are following me. I said, go for the throat, right? It was summed up perfectly by that third and 11 clo to close out the game. Uh, so Nance and Romo loved their call of this and let it just wash over you this morning. Pressure. Gonna do it. Higgins somehow able to get that reception with Joshua Williams all over him. Oh, I want to go to Cincinnati so bad. Uh, it was a gutsy call in the moment, and if that if that is incomplete, Mahomes has almost two minutes to march down the field, uh, knowing that a touchdown will win KC the game. Gutsy execution for Burrow to hang in the pocket with the guy. There's a dude barreling down on him, and then Higgins to make that grab in traffic. So I love uh, what Joe had to say after the game when he was asked about playing it safe. Trying to play it safe for you, not. I mean, no, I'm trying to. I mean, you you know the kind of you know the quarterback they have on the other side of the ball. You know we can't settle for a field goal there. He's going to go down and win the game. So we got to find a way to to get that conversion. And team made a big play, just like he did last year in the in the AFC Championship. Same route. Unbelievable catch. I loved this. Uh, I was tweeting about it. Don't kick a field goal. Don't let me catch you kicking a field goal. So the confidence, this mentality, yeah, this was me. If they kick a field goal on this drive, I'm going to lose it because I also know the quarterback on the other side. And it's hard to make those gutsy calls and then to execute them perfectly. But this mentality of staying aggressive, of slamming the door, not just taking the safe route, praying your defense gets a stop, this is what could potentially take this team even th further than it did last season. Instead of letting what happened in the Super Bowl last year put fear of doubt in them, it seems like it almost empowered and emboldened these Bengals. They went through every team's worst nightmare with how the loss to the Rams played out, right? And then there's this lazy narrative uh, that is stuffed in our faces all off season. That for the last 10 months, my goodness, teams that lose the Super Bowl are terrible the next year. They've proven that that's BS, I must swore. BS. They, they are every bit of the team they were in 2021. Maybe some pieces were reshuffled. All of that media chatter was absolute bull. And this fan base doesn't have anything to be worried about. Joe Burrow is just different. And as long as you have him, you're okay. And the locker room is different. And not only the rest of the AFC, but the rest of the league should be afraid of that. And speaking of the rest of the AFC. Let's take a look. Playoff picture thrown into complete madness. I like this. Yesterday's events. By the way, who had a better day than the Bills yesterday? Come on. You're sitting pretty. Everything that you needed to happen there, Bills fan Brian, happened. The Chiefs and Dolphins, that means the Bills are again firmly in the one seed. Bengals in a wild card spot because the AFC North uh, leading the Ravens. They also got a win miraculously yesterday. Cincy does now have a two-game cushion over those in the hunt teams, though, meaning they should feel pretty comfortable getting into the playoffs and then wreaking havoc on the rest of the league. Uh, okay, let's talk about this. I mentioned the Dolphins' loss. Um, they fell 33-17 to 17 at the hands of the Niners, Sands, Jimmy Garoppolo. That is a game that we should dig into here as a takeaway from yesterday. First off, thoughts out to Jimmy Garoppolo, a team leader, a winner. He's done his thing, and now he's done for the year uh, with a foot injury. Tremendous performance this season, though, in place of Trey Lance, dealing with all that drama better than anyone could. Um, and he, this is a guy who's written off all of the time. That shouldn't be glossed over. And I do think that even if... Uh, uh, even if you know the new the new quarterback, or they bring Baker in, whatever it is, whatever happens, it's hard to fill the void from a leadership perspective, from a locker room perspective, from a winning and confidence and experience perspective that Jimmy Garoppolo brought to this locker room. But then I'm not going to just give up on this team because there was no reason to, especially after what I saw yesterday. The Niners rallied, and Brock Purdy deserves credit here. The 262nd. And final pick of the draft out of Iowa State, okay? He was forced into action. He looked awesome, finishing 210 yards, two touchdowns in relief of Jimmy. And Shanahan, he had some interesting things to say about the performance. Listen to this. Brock came in and made some big plays. Um, I mean, he plays, he's, he's got some balls out there. Forgive me for saying it that way. Um, he's, you know, we, we got to clean some stuff up, obviously. 
Um, but just throwing them in there in the heat of battle like that, um, how much zero that team did too, um, which you guys could see. I mean, that was a big plan of theirs, and they had some good adjustments, taking away some of our hot throws. So we were having to change a lot of stuff on the fly. So um, putting a lot of pressure on him in that way, and um, I thought he did a hell of a job doing it. He did, and it's going to be on him and on Shanahan, of course. There's a lot of pressure. The Rook held up yesterday, but let's be honest, the defense for the Niners really got this thing done. <sighs> Two long touchdown passes, beautiful ones, man. That one to Tyreek was sweet. But they stifled this Dolphins attack, one of the best teams in the league. They held Miami without a third-down conversion on the day. N Nick Bosa, I mean, stamp it, put it away, and just give him the award now. That is your defensive player of the year. His three sacks move him into the league lead, and he just consistently got after Tua. He made it hell for him. And he, there was no, yeah, there he is. There was no world the Dolphins could have any rhythm when this was going on. So you look at it, three sacks, unbelievable. I think he's up to, what, 14 and a half, I think, on the year. Uh, the Niners, if we take a look at the playoff picture, they're on top of the West. And why, while I think the road's gotten sort of significantly tougher without Jimmy G, I do believe that. It is tougher. I'm not going to bury them yet. The defense, Debo, CMC, Kittle, Trent Williams, all the talent John Lynch has amassed on the roster, this team is still extremely dangerous. And to all the people saying the Niners season is over, uh, I leave you with this. There he is, the shrug. I'm doing the shrug for him. We'll see. Jimmy's going to create an uphill battle. I think they're going to be okay. And it's not to take away from what Jimmy Garoppolo means. It just means it's a great team also, and Shanahan's going to keep them going. And this Baker Mayfield news, don't think that's not connected in some weird way. Panthers decide this morning, right before the show, to release Baker Mayfield. Now, of course, he has to go through waivers. He's going to have to do that. But, I mean, you, you got to tell me, Shanahan and Lynch aren't saying, hey, McCaffrey, get in here. McCaffrey, you spent time with him. With the Panthers a little bit, what's he like? What's what's his story? Can he carry this team? Can he do what he did for the Browns and rely on a defense and a run game and great play calling? Can he do that here? Oh, maybe that'd be a good guy to have. The Niners did this great thing where they they think about what they did. They had a, a, a young player who wasn't ready, uh, an older player who's injury prone, and and now they have Purdy who looked good. I don't. I'm not. I'm not ready to buy in on Purdy completely yet, but I believe in this team. And then you potentially have, you know, people are trying to say Rodgers should go there. That, the, 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 you know, somehow, even though the trade deadline was 19 weeks ago, <laughs> they were able to, to get him sometime and not have a mil $100 million in dead cap space. Baker is an interesting guy to look at. And we'll talk to Brandon Marshall about that right after this. Coming up, yes, he's one of my best friends in the whole world. He's an I Am Athlete Media mogul, Brandon Marshall. He's hearing me and he's saying, let's talk about it. Look at that fit, though. All right, time to dig a little bit deeper into yesterday's action and welcome an all-pro wide receiver and founder of Media Empire, I am athlete, Brandon Marshall. <laughs> Brandon. You give me the best intros. That's right. But Brandon, you're wearing, first I was like he's wearing Kelly Green because the Eagles are doing their thing in the NFC. But then I think, is this an homage to your former Jet squad? Because listen, Mike F. and White looked okay, but outside of Garrett Wilson, they could have used you yesterday, buddy, against the Vikings. No, they were okay, but this is definitely Jet Green. Yeah. Okay. We played well yesterday, but we didn't get the W, and that's all that matter. Uh, Mike, you see that pass that he threw on that fourth down, that dagger to Corey Davis? Unbelievable. He thread the needle, but he didn't finish it. He got to finish the game. He got to finish the game. If he finished the game, we could potentially be talking about Mike White as the quarterback of the future, but he needs to show a little bit more now. You think it was on him and not on the receivers outside of Garrett? Listen, well, you also had Corey Davis had a big game. Mm -hmm. Corey had a huge game, he, and he came down with some big catches. What I would have liked to see more of Elijah Moore, absolutely don't know what's going on there, but he was targeted six times. He was able to touch the ball, but they did a decent job. Yeah. It came down to situational football. You hear some of these football people talk about it all the time. The games are won in these critical moments. You get down to the red zone, okay? All right? You run it. You should have. We should have ran the ball, I felt, okay? Monday. Now I'm playing Monday morning quarterback, yes. and I got to be sensitive because I know some of the Jets' uh, uh, upper brass is going to be listening to this, and, and they watch us, and, 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 and they comment, okay? They may not do it publicly, but it could happen. <laughs> but this happens across the board on all these little legends that go on to do media stuff. But I would have ran the ball on first, second, and third down, okay. right? Going out there and throwing the ball the way we did in the tight red to go try to finish the game off, I didn't think that was the best approach. 
But hey, I'm Monday morning quarterback. I think they could have used you out there, buddy. I want to talk about your other team. <laughs> it's it's uh, not strange to me that you're not wearing orange and blue because Chicago uh, looked very much like Chicago when they face Green Bay every time it what, happens. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Can I flip it? Can I become the host really quickly? Of course. What the hell? Like, why can't we beat? You know, you know the Chicago Bears better than I do. Ooh. You grew up there. What is happening? With this whole Chicago Bears versus Aaron Rodgers and Green Bay Packers. I don't know. I would, you know, you think a, a thumb injury, messed up ribs, brutal year for the Packers might be enough where they can, f you know, they almost did it. And I, I, you tell me, you were there. You played them six times. Want me to tell? I'm going to flip it back on you. You're, <laughs> you, in your time there, were one in five against Rodgers, and in the game that the Bears won. Rodgers got hurt after throwing two passes. So is it Aaron? <laughs> is it more Aaron? Or is it more some weird, deep-seated mentality that the Bears hand that they can't shake? It's 100% Aaron Rodgers. I don't know if you remember this game. We had this legendary game. I think it was 2013. 2013, the, the Green Bay Packers, they're in Soldier Field. They traveled to us. I believe it was like Sunday night football <laughs> or Monday night football. All right? If we win this game, Kay, we go into the playoffs, all right? Now, mind you, never been to the playoffs, all right? So I'm super excited, and I'm having the game of my life, right? We're having a legendary year that year. That defense, remember that was the year that Brian Urlacher, yeah, Lance Craig, Julius Peppers, uh, uh, Charles Peanut Tillman, Tim Jennings, those guys were scoring like a touchdown or two every single game. We had the same type of challenge like the Broncos had. We had this legendary defense. And on offense, we just couldn't score a lot of points. Now, were we moving the ball? Yes, but we couldn't score a lot of points. So it was a tough thing. Anyways, we get to the fourth quarter. We dominate the Green Bay Packers. It comes down to the very last play of the game. And guess what happens? Julius Peppers comes off the right side. He beats the tackle, the left tackle. I mean, it, it was like the left tackle wasn't even there. He has Aaron Rodgers right there. All he has to do is just push him. He can blow, he could have blow on Aaron Rodgers. Just blow on Aaron Rodgers. He falls down. The game is over. We go in the playoffs. We may even win the Super Bowl. But guess what happens? Aaron Rodgers found a way to dip out of it. The great Julius Peppers falls, misses him. And then you see Randall Cobb streaking down the side and he throws the ball. He catches it. Game over. It's Aaron Rodgers. He finds a way to get it done. He finds a way to get it done. Unbelievable. And it's yeah. all him. If you take him out of that organization, they, yeah, well, yeah, they're not even a good organization if he's not there over the last 15 years, right? Because it's a quarterback-driven league. We know that. It certainly is, and he's doing it. Even, I mean, Christian Watson would have said he's become he. Yeah, I think it's a lot about confidence. Aaron just goes in there thinking, I own the joint, gives the salute, says it's his. And that's what, and Chicago downtrodden just gets beat up by him all the time. And here he is, somehow gets it done. Uh, you know, you're, you were mentioning that game, that playoff game. Your quarterback, and you guys couldn't get much going on offense. Your quarterback was Jay Cutler. You know, did you see that Jay Cutler was at this game? I did not see that. Look here at he Jay. is, your boy. Look at Jay. He's looking hot. Look how cute he looks right now. I can't say anything. He does not look, oh he does goodness. not look, look terrible. He I don't is know, so cute. I don't know a man that can wear a vest like that and make it look. <laughs> Cute in your he's words, but he can do it. He, he's aging well. I love smoking Jay. Why don't you he's face? Why don't you FaceTime him right now? Where, what's, what's it gonna take? <laughs> what is it gonna take? You know, <laughs> he won't answer. He'll he leaves me on red. He leaves you on. When's the last time you talked to him? We got. I gotta work this out. We gotta open this thing up. I talked up. to Jay a couple months ago. Like we messaged a couple All months right. ago. Really quick. Hey, hey, how you doing? He was I want to get him on my show. I know. That's but we've, why, been, that's, we've been saying this since week one. I know. And is this like uh, six shows in a row that we've mentioned Jay Cutler? Yes, we're are you, on, we're are you on doing the this intentionally? It's called manifestation. I don't know what, what you think it is. It's clearly just putting out the energy for your gonna, show and for And mine. your show. I'm a big Jay no, Cutler you know what? Fan, All three, you know. No, 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 no. This is what we're going to do. It's going to be on your show, and you're going to be the mediator. You're right. going to sit right in the middle. Yes. Box, and you gotta, of, box of Kleenex. Boom, boom. That's right. You got you to you navigate the conversation. Yeah. You got to lead the conversation. Super Bowl week. Are you going to be in Arizona? I am. Okay. Well, we'll have to meet up there and, and get that done. Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's do it. Um, you also told me you were going to send me Brian Dable's number. I'm still waiting for. Speaking of leaving people on red, I... uh, 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 uh. you still want that? 
Should we talk you still about want that? I, I, after yesterday? No, because now, now they have a stupid tie. You know how hard it is to figure out the playoff picture when you have a tie? It's the worst <laughs> thing you could do to any member of the NFL media. Way to go. I'd rather them lose the game, fade it, throw the game, and don't get a tie because it makes my Brutal. life more difficult, and it's obviously all Brutal. about me. Okay, let me, <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about Lamar Jackson. Okay, this is not now serious business. It's a knee injury. We never take that lightly, especially him. I never want to hear it about him. And he's undergoing tests. He's got an MRI today, but it sounds like a knee sprain. So uh, it might cost him a couple games, but maybe he avoided something super serious. That's what we're hoping. We all know that he's set to hit free agency this offseason. How does this affect his impact and his ability to get that big paycheck and what's going on with him contract-wise? Yeah, I thought about this when I saw that he went down. Um, I was watching a few other games live, bouncing back and forth, so I wasn't 100% focused on his game. So news broke, boom. Um, and then you immediately start thinking about everything you talked about. Well, number one, is he okay? And how severe is it? Is it an ACL? Is it a patella tendon? Uh, what is it? And then you start thinking about very quickly, God damn, this is why players need to get the contract ASAP. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, right? But here's the situation with Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson will get his deal done, right? This is a part of the game and they know that. Uh, uh, it seems like it's not a, a season ending injury. It's not an ACL, it's what it seems like. They're saying a, a knee sprain. Right. That's what they're saying. Getting the MRI today. Yes. So with that being said, if he doesn't if he doesn't take the field again, he still would get a big deal. And if I'm actually Lamar Jackson, I may even consider that. Right. Like this will be a scare. It's like, you know what? I came out here. I gave you guys my all. Yes. I'm having another big year. Personally, the team is doing really good. It's not great, but we're doing good. We're in contention. But I'm not going to go out there and risk the rest of my career. Right. Because we didn't get the deal done before. The market is the market. If you're a top five quarterback and, and and you're you're within range, if Aaron Rodgers go out there and recess the market, then you're when you're up, then you can come in and reset the market. Then you have Dak Prescott, you have Russell Wilson, you have all these guys coming yeah. in and resetting the market. There was no reason why this deal shouldn't have got done. Right. So I love that Lamar Jackson and his mother, Felicia, mm -hmm. stood on the table and said, no, we want the deal that we want because they deserve it. They so Lamar Jackson, go ahead. They do, but if you're from your from the player's perspective, perspective 100%, but now if you're the Ravens, you have back-to-back -back seasons and this is an MVP we're talking about. We know what he can do. We know what he hasn't done yet, but you have a player who deals with injuries and that's a reason to not pay him. So if you're the Ravens, do you open up the checkbook for Lamar Jackson still? Listen, if you don't, you'll be stupid. Cuz cuz guess what, Kay? It may not be 31 other teams that will open it up, but I, I, I promise you, there may be 10. Yeah. There may be 10. Hell, there may be some quarter. There may be some teams that that have their quarterbacks, their franchise quarterbacks, that may say, you know what, we got to rethink this. If Lamar Jackson's free, right? Lamar Jackson is a, is a once in a lifetime talent. You got to take that chance. You do that, and of course, this is the name of the game. We didn't do that with Josh Allen, right? Josh Allen, Josh Allen takes more hits than Lamar Jackson. Think about that. He plays the game the same way, right? So why aren't we having that same discussion, that same conversation? Why did Josh Allen get the deal he he got, right? So what I would say if I am the Baltimore Ravens yes. is double down on Lamar Jackson. Double down on Lamar Jackson. I love to hear it. I want him to get paid, of course. I think he's headed toward franchise tag land. Mm, I wouldn't take that because you're in the same situation. I think the, the franchise tag is ridiculous, okay? You know how the franchise tag was created, Kay? How? Okay, I'm in New York right now, and I'm okay. looking outside downtown. About 30, 40 years ago, John Elway and Mr. B, Pat Bowling, rest in peace, great legendary owner of the Denver Broncos. John Elway is about to leave the Denver Broncos, Mr. B walks into the NFL headquarters and say, there's no way this can happen. There's no way this can happen. And within hours, they came up with the franchise tag. They came up with this franchise tag to protect the team from losing a guy like John Elway, to give them more time to negotiate. Now, it was put together in good faith. Okay, it wasn't a scrap. It wasn't a dirtbag deal. It was, hey, we just want to put the franchise tag in place 
just to give us more time to get a long-term deal in place, meaning not throughout a year, but throughout an offseason. So now you're seeing these teams in modern day take this franchise tag, use it to their benefit, and leverage it to get everything they can out of a player so they don't have to give them more guarantee. So you can have a, a, a guy who, you know, you franchise tag next year, and then you can franchise tag him again. And then all of a sudden, he gets hurt or he doesn't play up to his ability, and now you move on. Well, that's not a good deal. In business, a good deal is a fair deal, which means somebody wins on this side, somebody wins on the other side. It's not a good deal if the organizations and the team have all the leverage. Uh I, I will say some some players do. The only, I, everything you're saying ha, is valid, but some players do benefit from the franchise. Look, look at Kirk Cousins, right? Double franchise tag, got all that money, then got his big deal, right? So, so there. I don't is, like it though. You don't like it, yeah. But it's not yeah, like, it, like, not it. like the NFL I, guarantees money, and you're like guaranteed to get it. That's all I, wish wash, riff raff, anyway. Well, you're, you're, what you're saying is right, Kay, but that's like uh, going to Vegas and rolling dice, right? Like Kirk Cousins went to Vegas, he rolled dice. Yeah. He didn't have the knee injury like, you know, uh, Lamar Jackson. And I think there was an example a couple years ago, somebody, it was Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott, remember Dak Prescott yes. had the big ankle? Now he was in prime position. He's a quarterback. It's a little different situation. Dallas love him. He still ended up getting his deal, right? But you go into that year without any guarantee past that year. And if you have, get hurt like that, then all the leverage goes back onto the team side. So it's like rolling dice to me. I just think, you know, we, we play in a, a, a injury play a league and players got to play the game accordingly. It's true. And it's, you know, I think the argument people are trying to make is that he's got a skill set as a runner and that leads to right. more injuries. You're bringing up his knees and then does his passing ability justify getting that big deal? I would argue yes. And I would argue this is an MVP that needs to be paid. We got more with Brandon Marshall after this. Baker Mayfield just got dropped from the Panthers. So is he going to the Bay? What? What? Is he, he could. Him and McCaffrey reunite? I want, could. I want Rodgers. I want Rodgers to somehow wind up in the Bay. This year, win a Super Bowl. We'll be back. Back on Up and Adams, Ian Rapport saying the Panthers expected to release quarterback Baker Mayfield. He'll hit waivers when it's finalized later today. Let's go around the league and hit on some of these matchups. Uh, we have Brandon Marshall with us, so it was announced. Uh, what do you make of it? Do you think that the Niners should put in a claim for one Baker Mayfield? Yeah, I'm not surprised. And a lot of times behind the scenes, uh, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of talk. Hell, Baker Mayfield and his team may have seen Jimmy Garoppolo go down and immediately rushed into the Panthers front office and said, let me out of here, right? Because when you think about it, it could potentially be a great fit. Now, I like how the kid Purdy, is that what you say? Is that Mr. Irrelevant? How you say his name, K. That's Purdy? That's right, Purdy. Purdy. He was pretty Purdy. good yesterday. And, and listen, what I loved about him, I'm getting goosebumps saying this, and I'm thinking about this. The kid has some type of moxie, some type of flair. Every time he was throwing the ball, he was throwing his face like this, pumping his fist, throwing his fingers yeah. like that. Like, the kid got something, so they'll be okay. And I also love that San Francisco 49ers picking up Josh Johnson. Phenomenal vet, phenomenal leader. Hell, when Russell Wilson went down early in the year in Denver, they should have threw him in there instead of the other guy. But we'll talk about that another time. The reason why this could potentially be a good fit for Baker Mayfield, if his mind is right, Mr. Baker, mm -hmm. get your mind right. Because this is the type of system that he's used to. If you go back to 2020, the kid threw for 3,600 yards. He had 20-something touchdowns and eight interceptions. Okay, Vimar. All right. And but but it but think about but think about football, the science of their football. Kevin Stefanski. Kevin Stefanski, he learned a lot about what he does from Gary Kubiak. Gary Kubiak was under the Mike Shanahan tree. Mm -hmm. Gary Kubiak, cool, head coach of the Texans, head coach of the Denver Broncos, won a Super Bowl. How did they get it done? Stretch right, stretch left. Keepers, boots, get the ball out quick. So this is his type of ball, right? If he can goes, if he can get in there, right, sit on there, if pretty something happens there and get his opportunity, we could see a resurgence of Baker Mayfield. Now that's a big, 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 big if, but I see I can't see it happen. Whether it's Baker who could be a nice fit, or Purdy, who showed you some moxie yesterday, beating and taking down one of the best teams in the entire NFL, yeah. can the Niners still contend in the NFC regardless? 
Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I, I'll be honest here, right? Like, I'll I be watching ESPN. I'll be watching FS1. I'll be watching the Up and Adam show, and I'll be listening <laughs> to y'all takes, right? So <laughs> I'm listening to all y'all talk about it, right? And, 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 and uh, I think it was uh, uh, Orlovsky was saying, look, defensively, they, they've given up uh, more than 20 points once, right? And what Purdy did is what they asked Jimmy G to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So you got to think about it. They're not asking a quarterback to do much because they have the best defense, you know. So, yes, they can still contend. And they, they it, it hasn't only been this way this year. It's been this way for the past five years or so. They haven't asked Jimmy Garoppolo to do much. Remember the year they went to the Super Bowl mm -hmm. in that legendary run where Jimmy Garoppolo was in the playoffs and only attempting, attempting 12 to 15 passes. Right. So, but you think the experience of Jimmy, the fact that he's a team, you know, he's a winner, the team loves him, the team stands for him. You get to that that experience, he's got Super Bowl experience. And, but he, you know, if they were a deep ball away from winning a Super Bowl, he couldn't do that. You think Purdy or Baker will do it in that spot? Baker Mayfield, and I like Baker, but Baker has yet to show me as an NFL fan that in a big spot that matters, he can hit a ball and really get it in somebody's hands and make a play. I have not. Uh, yeah. show, show me that tape. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you there. But the Purdy kid, and this is where I thought you was going to go with the Jimmy G take was, you know, the guys rally around him. Right. You were talking about his experience mm -hmm. and th those things. But then you went into, you know, him being there before. So, yeah, you obviously missed that. But I just think this team is just built differently, man. And that's why Purdy was able to go in there and play the way he did. But he played with a lot of energy and he played with a lot of personality. And guys will rally around that. So, yeah. you know, the same way guys rally around Jimmy G, you're seeing guys, and you saw it yesterday, guys rally around him. We love that stuff as football players. Man, look at him. They're probably on the sideline when he's doing all of this stuff and, and, and getting excited. You had the vets and you had coaches. You had coach, you probably yeah. had Mike Shanahan in the booth calling down like, son, do you see this kid, this kid, Mike? They might be saying we might got our guy. We might have our guy. Yeah. It's true. I will say that with Jimmy G, I'm not trying to take anything away from him because they win, and they win because they're a good team. They win because they have a good defense. They win because of Shanahan. But they operate, and they this makes sense in my opinion, they win at a different level with Jimmy G, and they're 40-19 and 19 with him starting. There's something to that that's a little more than team and putting it on Shanahan and relying on their defense. Like They operate a little differently with Jimmy G under center. I'm excited to see if the Niners can stay on top, and I wouldn't put it past them to do that. All right, let's get to this stupid tie between the Commanders and the Giants. Take a look. <laughs> Feels like a loss. Um, but again, like I said earlier, uh, it doesn't count as one, so that's, that's only positive in this game. Both teams trying to battle into the playoffs, 2020 tie. We saw some comebacks. We saw some moxie, to use your words. Ultimately, not the result either of these teams or quarterbacks wanted. So uh, if we take a look at the playoff picture to set this up for people watching, the tie, combined with the Seahawks' win, has actually knocked Washington out of the playoff picture for now. The Giants, so the, they're on life support. They're clinging to a wild card right now, but they have one win in their last five games. Brandon. We Say that know. again. They have what? One win in their last five games. Wow. Jeez. Let, let me ask you this. We know Odell visited New York last week. He also met with the Bills. Today, my Odell tracker has him in Dallas meeting with the Cowboys. Do you think adding OBJ solves some of their problems and would jumpstart this team again? And how big of a factor is Odell in the NFC East race, in the NFC playoff race, if he goes to, the, you know, whether it's the Giants or whether he goes to the Cowboys? Absolutely. Not only uh, what he will do on Sundays and now Mondays and Thursdays, all these other days that we play on in the NFL. Business is booming. Great job, <laughs> NFL uh, office. But, um, you know, Odell brings something else to the entire organization. Now, Kay, I was there. I played with the Giants in 2018, and that was pretty much my last cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And what he did in the locker room, what he did in the weight room, it was special. In the off-season training, right? Like the way he ran sprints and pushed all of us to to try to keep up. It's just different. There's going to be a different energy in the locker room with the music on it. You know, I don't know where he's at today. He's much mature. You know, he settled down. He has a, a son, a beautiful son. Mm -hmm. But he brings so much juice 
And that's what you need this part of the season. What Julian Edelman calls this cream season. This is when it matters. Football after Thanksgiving. You need juice. You need energy. Guys are beat up. Guys are tired. Right? All kinds of things are going on. And the guy that can just push you and say, you know what, we can go to another level, that's Odell. And it, and it goes a long way. So I think Odell going back to New York, me personally, I would love to see that. Okay? But – after last night, that fourth quarter, and him probably being somewhere in Dallas, maybe even in the building, but I know he's in the building today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like Dallas may have the edge now. Like, how do you walk away from a, a outing like that, that fourth quarter, and say, man, they mm-hmm. did that without me? Just imagine if I was there, right? He's a Southern boy. Uh, I, I know he loves Dak. I know he loves the guys there, but it's a toss-up now. But it, me personally, Kate, I want to see him go back to New York. Where should he go? I think he should go back to New York. You, you I think, think so, and you think in, it's, in, it's in his best interest to come back. I'm looking to at him. I'm looking at the totality of a career. Okay, so what I'm looking at is can a player can he reach his goals uh, individually? Uh, uh, you know, can he can he reach them collectively, meaning as a team, mm-hmm. and then also financially, right? So a few things. Financially, there's still more meat on the bone for Odell, but Odell is not hurting for anything. Odell will be fine. He's a he's he's a, ascended to a global icon. Yes. All right. So financially, he's okay, but there are more meat. There is more meat on the bone. From a collective standpoint, you've achieved the greatest thing. If you didn't even if you didn't go down in the Super Bowl, you would have been the Super Bowl MVP. Odell has his ring. Now, what I'm looking at for Odell because the last couple of years since he's been gone has been tough. It's been up and down, if we're being honest. If I'm Odell and going back to New York, the biggest media market of the world with that type of personality, that type of play, I'm out there as the number one receiver, okay? And I'm also back home. Like, this is the perfect story for me. Legacy to being the number one guy, right? To getting the money, to all of it. Like, that's what I would do. I just, it's a, great, it's a great answer. I just remember three months ago, you and I were sitting here talking about how we should go to, how we should go to the Packers. Because <laughs> we were saying that's yeah, the best fit. Why are you going to bring that up? Come on, Because can I both of my... us said, okay, I brought that up because we were, we were wrong about the Packers. But you know what we were, <laughs> you and I were both right about was A.J. Brown. Mm. We got to give him some love, but we got to give the Titans some heat here. Because the, the revenge game of a lifetime, this is all what I would want for a guy like A.J. Brown. He had over 100 yards, two, I don't know if you saw him, absolutely ridiculous touchdowns with the Eagles' blowout win over the Titans. I don't think you can even argue or say anything about this point if the Titans trading was the biggest mistake ever. But do you think that the Titans can recover and stay in contention in the AFC, or is there, did this completely ruin their window? I think they can. I, I think they can recover. I mean, you said a lot. Let me try to hit this quickly so we can move on. Um, but A.J. Brown, number one, uh, 10, 10 targets, eight receptions, 119 yards, two touchdowns, and those catches that you talked about, what I saw as a receiver, I saw just Mr. Consistent. I saw, like, damn, that's the reason why yeah. you try to figure it out if you're the Tennessee Titans. But, Kay, I got to push back on you a little bit here. When you look at the Tennessee Titans, you can't pay everyone. And mm-hmm. the philosophy to make about this team is play really good defense, so you want to pay guys there. But then you had uh, Tannehill, who had a really good year before he's born into his contract year, and they had to make a decision. They did a decent deal. He's making like $19, $20 million a year right right now. So it's decent. And then you have the King. So, Kay, are we going to pay the King, AJ, and Tannehill, and my big tackle? Like, there's not going to be enough money to to invest on the defensive side. Yeah, Am I hearing a receiver say to not pay a, rece- a receiver? Like, in my ear piece not working? Well, hit, well, look, there's big bags everywhere, and there's more teams that can pay the receiver. He got his money. But what I'm talking about is just straight philosophy, yeah. right? Like, it, both, both sides are right. They both work, right? They can still get it done without A.J. Brown because they're investing in other people. You got to make the decision. Do you? Do you want King Henry or do you want AJ Brown? Right, like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta I mean, make that decision. In order for it to come out and be a good decision that they did that was Traylon Burks has to be that dude. I disagree. 
You don't think he has to be? What do you mean? How can you disagree well, with that? Well, because I don't think, when I think that about That went Tennessee into the Titans. philosophy of the decision. We're going to choose to play a running back who has 9 million carries a year, and he's we're, our whole offense is going to be him. Um, and then they've got, they're paying Taylor Luan, who's not healthy, yeah. who will be on the show tomorrow, which I can't wait to talk to him. Ooh, or ooh, we'll, ooh, you know, ooh. like, and they invested and said, you know what? We see the, the difference between Traylon Burks and what he can be can sort of fill the thing, the consistency that A.J. Brown was. It has to work out for Traylon Burks. Well, here's what I believe. Their brand of football is let's play really good defense, let's be a really smart team, all right, and then let's run the ball. And then not, they don't, basically, they don't value the wide receiver. They don't value the wide receiver like that. And that's okay, right? The Baltimore Ravens have never gone out there and made a big, big splash in, in free agency, getting a receiver at the peak of his career. Um, so, and they still won a Super Bowl. So I see the Tennessee Titans with that same type of football, and it's okay. It's about can they get the job done? Can they sneak into the playoffs? And if they can, I think it's a successful year. Uh, and, of course, our thoughts with Traylon Burks. He took a hit yesterday. It looked like a brutal hit. So we're um, giving him our best. Uh, okay, we love you. Brandon Marshall, again, you took the entire hour. You got to go? <laughs> you took the entire hour. I, ain't got, I don't have any more real estate to give you. You're the best. Let's just keep going. <laughs> we'll talk to you. Go. Uh, we'll talk on. to you very soon. And, and, yes, I do believe Taylor Lewan is on the show tomorrow. You can come back and hang out with, you, with Taylor. Uh, Tell we Taylor love Brandon hi. Marshall. Yeah, I will. Uh, I am at the – call Jay Cutler. Call Jay Cutler. We'll be back. We had some uh, other amazing moments, some local heroes to gut to, and Cam Hayward, Connor Hayward are among them. I can share a story. Like, this morning, me and him went to my dad's grave, and, you know, we got to share a moment there. Um, and so I was pretty emotional when, uh, you know, he got the, the, the touchdown. Uh, I don't like to be Mr. Soppy, but like that, that like really hit me. Luckily, there wasn't a camera on me because I was a mess. That, of course, Steelers all pro Cam Hayward, all pro human, all pro player, wearing his dad's Falcons jersey. They're talking about the emotions of seeing his brother Connor score his first career touch on his first touchdown to help lead Pittsburgh to a 1916 win over Atlanta. And listen, it must be one thing to watch your little bro find the end zone for the first time, it's another to have it happen in your hometown and in the same place as your father, your late father, the late Craig Ironhead Hayward, where he carved out the best seasons of his career. And the, this is really cool. If that wasn't enough, someone dug this up, the play that Ironhead scored. This is what you're looking at. His first career touchdown. Does that look familiar to anybody? That is wildly, nearly identical to the one Connor scored on yesterday. So all of the feels, all of the love, for the Hayward family and Cam also, and he had a sack in yesterday's game. I saw it happen. And the brothers' efforts not only helped the Steelers pick up the win, but helped keep them alive in this wild AFC playoff race. So Pittsburgh's won three of their last four. They sit two games back of a wild card spot, and they have uh, a nice little schedule if you look at it down the stretch as well. So congrats to the Hayward brothers for putting together uh, a special performance and moment. And uh, I'll say this, Cam, don't sleep on those Steelers. We'll be back after this. Back on Up and Adams. When is, when is it some when something happens? It's always you three. Is this a Harry Potter thing? Hamilton, head of content. Who keeps putting Harry Potter stuff on the show? <laughs> that one was not me. Uh, I do understand the reference, but uh, yeah. I don't, but I have you here. Listen, I had a parlay yesterday. <laughs> no surprise, it did not hit. <laughs> so here's what uh, I went to FanDuel and I said, You listen, and you listen good. Oh, shoot, you almost knocked over the table. Is that a bad omen? Probably. I said, You listen good, FanDuel Sports. Look, you give me an odds boost. You odds boost this tonight. And we did something very cool and unique, and you can't get this anywhere. You can't go to your local grocery store and pick this up in aisle eight. No, Chris Olave, Mike Evans, and Chris Godwin combine for 125 plus receiving yards and one rushing or receiving touchdown. What do you got here? And that's what's cool about this is this is custom. You can't really do this usually on FanDuel Sportsbook. And it's I know it's three players that you have yes. talked up and that you've absolutely loved over the years. And it's also cool because you have something, no matter who has the ball, you have something to root for. So I think this is the night. I think it's happening. <gasps> I think we're popping the champagne tomorrow. I'm all in. No, I have a huge meeting after the show. I cannot have champagne. Oh, oh no. We're that's when it will happen. It'll care. happen when it's like you're interviewing George Clooney after the show. And then I'll be like, what? And then I'll be disgusting and look wretched, which is great. And I would do that <laughs> if we get this done. We need we sure. need it to hit. I was on a call this morning at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I need a win. 
just as long as you don't wear the jeans with the holes in them, um, we'll be we'll be all right. Tomorrow. I would refuse service at a restaurant in Los Angeles because I had holes. <laughs> in my jeans, and you know what? And then they wanted me to change, and I said, absolutely not. And it all just happened put on the with an earshot of an NFL owner. It's all great. Just put on the gift shop pants, Kay. It's no, not, we have, we it'll have be a fine. Lot of time. I thought we had like one minute. We have a couple <laughs> minutes to talk here. Uh, yeah. Here's the thing, here, can we pull up the parlay again? I'm gonna, I'm gonna clown on this a little bit. Um, it doesn't, is it, I'm just gonna ask it, because I'm real. It doesn't seem like much of a boost. Can you explain that to me? No, nah, I mean you go so uh, you go from minus odds to plus odds. That's a pretty good boost. Is it okay? Explain, keep going. Yeah. Really, I don't. I, don't, so, I want to understand. So when something is, when something's minus odds, that means that they think it's more than likely to happen. That that that's something that they think is going to happen. They think that those guys will combine for over 125 yards, right. and one of them will score a touchdown. I thought it when was it goes, minus to minus. That's what I really I couldn't see from there, <laughs> and I was like, that doesn't seem like much to so, help. This so is a getting, great boost. Oh yeah. So now you're getting plus odds on that. That's great. That's okay. what you want. So a lot, and I just think this this can't. Ha this is my listen. Like this is my team. This is like what I love. Like let's see it again, really quick. It's Olave, and I love Chris Godwin. I love all these guys. <laughs> please get it done. Poland lost. They're out. I wasn't bummed about that though, Hamilton. You know what? I, the U.S. too. Yeah, was, well, yeah, that I was I wasn't. That, see, it wasn't disappointing to me. I was the way I approached <laughs> Poland. I was like, you know, like uh, when you sneak into the, like the VIP tent at Coachella and you don't have a wristband and it's free food and you're just like in the quiet in the corner, quietly totally. enjoying it before you get kicked out because you're just like happy to be there. That's kind of how I approached Poland in the World Cup at the elimination stage. Like, just you're happy to be there. Didn't happen up against Mbappe and company, so I wasn't like that that excited about them getting through. Understand? Yeah, I feel, but once you get there, isn't there that hope that you get your Cinderella story? No? Yeah, tomorrow with a champagne shower on this damn show. Goodbye. Let's go.